Hi there. My name is Kai Hopmann and uh, I'm working at the Zuse Institute Berlin and at the Technical University of Berlin in the area of um, gas transport networks, the optimization of gas transport networks. Um, yeah, unfortunately, due to the circumstances, we cannot all be here together at the Zuse Institute in the beautiful city of Berlin, but at least we can all come together virtually and um, talk about combinatorial optimization. Um, as I said, I'm working in the area of gas transport networks, and um, yeah, in my talk, I will explain to you how we model the gas network control problem. Um, but before I continue, I would like to um, yeah to you to advise to watch uh, the video of my colleague Felix first, um, because he already talked about this problem, the fundamentals, and the project um, in more general. And uh, if you watch this video, this will definitely help you to understand more about what I. I am going to talk about. Yeah, so uh, let's jump into it. Yeah, in my talk I'm going to explain to you um, the mathematical formulation of the gas network control problem and um, I will show you how our solution approach, our solution framework. And uh, yeah, you m probably remember this slide from Felix's talk, um, but yeah, I just wanted to yeah, uh, remember you, what are we, what is our goal here? So we want to optimize the short-term transient control of a large real-world gas transport network and uh, thereby build a navigation system for the dispatchers. Um, the dispatchers are the people who control the network in the control center and yeah, we want to give them some decision support. So we want to um, give them advice on how to control the network elements such that the network is um, operated safely and uh, in a robust fashion. Um, yeah, what are we given as the input? Um, as input we are given the topology of the network together with is its initial state in terms of the current flow and pressures. Um, and additionally we are given a short-term supply and demand forecast for the entries and exits and additionally for the entries we are given a pressure forecast um, for the yeah next 12 to 24 hours. Um, so what is the goal here? We want to control, find a control for each element over the considered time horizon such that the whole network is operated best. And uh, by a good control, a good control for us is that we satisfy all the given supplies and demands while we change the network control as little as possible. And um, yeah, what uh, that means or how we mathematically formulate that will be explained in a bit. So here you can see the uh, the uh, gas grid we are dealing with every day basically, and uh, yeah, this is the gas grid of our um, project partner Open Grid Europe, and um, um, yeah, as Felix already mentioned, such a gas grid con uh, consists of a lot of different elements. However, in the following, we are um, going to conceptually divide the network in two simple parts in a sense. So first of all we consider the network stations. Um, yeah, The network stations are the subgraphs which are located at um, the crossings of major transport pipelines, so the really big pipelines. And um, why do we consider those subgraphs there at these crossings? Well because basically all active elements, that means all elements that can be controlled by dispatchers, are located at one of these um, crossings. So um, yeah, so we have these network stations in mind, and the other thing that we have in mind are simply the is, is the pipeline network. So what you can conceptually now think of is you have a network that consists of network stations and the entries and the exits, and uh, these elements are all connected by um, by path of pipelines. So why do we divide the um, the network into these two parts. There's of course a reason for that. And uh, well, when we started to work on the gas network control problem, we first of all tried to derive a formulation um, dealing with all the different elements, um, the technical uh, constraints, the physics, and uh, combinatorics at once. But it turned out that the models were computationally intractable, um, in particular for the sizes of the networks we are dealing with. So we could solve them on really small toy example networks containing only few active elements. But uh, yeah, for the uh, size of the network, of our network that we are dealing with, um, we didn't get anywhere. And um, 
Well, while we built these models and tested different variants, we uh, figured out that there are two main sources of complexity um, in this problem. And the first source of complexity um, are the combinatorics of the network stations. As Felix mentioned, for each network station we have to find or determine uh, operation mode for each um, time step. An operation mode is a set or, um, or induces a setting for each active element in the network station. And um, well, for our biggest station, for example, we have about 2000 different operation modes. And now consider that we have t time steps. Um, that means that we already have 2000 to the power of t possibilities um, for the, the operation mode setting for um, a station in the problem. And now, since we have not only one, but even more network stations, um, you can you can you already probably have a feeling that this um, leads to a combinatorial explosion in terms of um, possibilities. And uh, the second source of complexity is, uh, or are of course, the physics of the gas flow in the pipelines. Um, Gas flow through pipelines is typically described by the so-called Euler equations, which is a set of nonlinear hyperbolic partial differential equations. And what you can see here are the is the isothermal variant of the Euler equations. So what we already did here is to assume that the temperature of the gas stays constant over the whole time, and thereby we are left with only um, two of these equations. Um, the upper one here is the so-called continuity equation, which ensures the conservation of mass. And the second, um, the second equation here is the momentum equation, which uh, describes the interaction between the force that acts on the gas particles and the rate of the change in the momentum. Um, in, uh, in in a little bit, we see a simplified version of these equations, and um, there I will explain you in a bit more detail what these equations mean and do. Well, and now since we have figured out these two main sources of complexity, what we came up with uh, was a two-stage approach. And the name of our two-stage approach is uh, COMPASS. COMPASS stands for Kontinuierliches Optimierungsmodul zur Prognose abgesichert Systemsteuerung or uh, freely translated into English Continuous Optimization Module for Prognosis-Based System Control. And well, how does it work? So in the first stage, uh, we replace the net, uh, in, the in the first step of the first stage, we replace the network stations by simplified graph representations. And in particular, that means that uh, we drastically reduce the number of operation modes by doing this. Um, yeah, I will um, shortly come back to this topic. Um, what uh, what we do is, uh, additionally is that we um, simplify the network even further, namely we merge pipes. So if you have two parallel pipes, for example, um, running from t between two nodes, we remove those and replace them by one big pipe, um, capturing, the, capturing the physics of the parallel pipes. Um, the same um, happens for sequential merges, so if you have a node of degree 2, and um, two adjacent or two two incident pipelines, we simply replace, um, remove this node and replace the two pipelines by one long pipeline. Another th uh, example, what we do is that we remove distribution networks. Distribution network networks are um, consists of um, pipelines only, so ba there's nothing to control, and um, all the gas flow and the physics happening in there are basically a consequence of the control decisions that we make in the network stations. So we can remove those in order to um, to reduce the size sizes of the models that we solve later on, and there are uh, many more. No, many more network simplifications that we apply. Um, if you're interested in that, um, please join the Q&A session and I can give you some more examples what we do too. Okay, and so the last step of the first stage and the main, most important step is now what we do is we solve the transient operation problem using linearized gas flow equations and in particular using these simplified graph representations from step one. And um, what we call this, mo the resulting model, we call the net model, and the algorithm to solve this is called then the net model algorithm. And the net model algorithm will be the topic of 
um, my talk. So we will discuss in particular step one and three um, a lot more in the following. But to give you a complete overview, I will n now show you um, what happens in the second stage of our two-stage approach. Well, first of all, we take the result from the net model algorithm and we retrieve the pressure and the flow values on the boundary nodes of the network stations. And um, these time series then serve as input to the transient operation problem on the original network stations. So we take our original network stations, so these subgraphs, and um, as scenarios or as input for them, we use the result from the net model algorithm. And then we solve the transient operation problem on this subgraph, but using the original network stations. So that means that we now you, um, have the complete combinatorics there. And um, what we do here is now we solve this model or these models for each of the network stations separately. So there is no more interconnection. The interconnection or the gas flow between the stations was already considered in the first stage. That's the ratio, res, re, rationale behind this. And yeah, if we when we have solved then um, um, the, the models for each of the station, so the station models by using the station model algorithm, um, we can then retrieve the results that then are serve as output for the dispatchers in particular or mainly the operation modes but there are um, other things um, that are of interest to dispatchers maybe target values which are special um, settings for um, compressors or co um, regulators um, yeah i won't go into detail here so but um, yeah basically so um, step one to three is the first stage of our approach step four to six the second stage um, I will now talk about the net model and net model algorithm, so in particular st step one and step three. And um, my colleague Mark, who will give the next talk, is um, then explaining you how the station model works and will give you more details on that. So before we talk about network stations, I first of all want to give you um, or show you how we model the transient gas flow through the pipelines. Um, what you can see here is a model that is already known from the literature. Um, here you have to, uh, we or you take the isothermal Euler equations, you apply some um, some well-known simplifications as well as a uh, discretization using an implicit box scheme, and then you are left with these two um, two equations. Um, here the variables. Um, are um, the important variants are the P for the pressure and Q for the flows at the nodes. And um, yeah, as you can see, the first equation is the continuity equation. Um, and here you can see, okay, in the first two summons, you basically determine the um, difference in pressure from um, time step Ti to time step Ti plus one. And given the pressure difference at the end nodes, um, in order to have zero on the right hand side, um, some flow has to happen to uh, in order to make up for these pressure differences. And the flow variables are here contained in the third summit. And the second equation um, basically describes the pressure loss due to friction. The friction term is the uh, you can see in the second row, and due to a height difference, which is um, the first summit in the second and in, in the third row here, and um, yeah, the problem that you have here, or what, not a problem, but what you still have here is um, that uh, the red, the term that we have in red, is uh, highly nonlinear. So you have here the um, um, the square of the of the um, flow um, divided by the pressure. And well, we first of all try to solve our mo models using um, these nonlinear uh, equations, um, but yeah, this also turned out to be um, computationally um, uh, intractable. Um, but uh, what we did then uh, is uh, the following simplification. Yeah, we fix the absolute velocity in this friction term. So um, by rearranging the terms, um, you can also express this uh, in terms of um, uh, absolute velocity times the flow and what we do now is that we fix the absolute velocity in this term to the velocity that the gas has in the initial time step. Of course obviously there's a problem so uh, what you can think of here is we're talking about the friction so let's say uh, in, in the initial time step you had 
I don't know, you had, uh, your gas was 10 uh, meters per second fast in a sense, um, and you get the resulting friction. So now, what happens now if you have um, flow which um, goes a lot quicker, you underestimate the friction. That means that the flow goes through the pipelines too quick and um, you might not see the nece necessity to compress the gas in order to make up for friction lossing there. So this has some drawbacks of course, but the good news if you do this is you have a linear um, equation. And well, when we looked at his historical data and uh, in general over the 12 to 24 hours, um, the speed of the gas in the pipelines doesn't change too drastically. So this was one, uh, this is one justification for the problem. And what we also have, or what we're currently working on, and uh, where we have promising results, is a uh, is a post-processing routine where you can um, take your result in the end, and uh, based on sequential linear programming, you can um, then, um, yeah, uh, derive a solution which is also feasible for the non-linear equation that I just showed you before. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, please join the Q and A session. I'm happy to explain to you what we are currently dealing there. But yeah, um, so these two equations now um, build the fundament or the, uh, describe um, the gas flow in our net model. Next I'm going to explain to you how we derive the simplified graph representations um, with which we replace the network stations. Um, so what you can see here is a network station. Um, this is um, yeah, is the sub subgraph or the subnetwork at the crossing of two major pipelines, and uh, here you can also see uh, many different elements, short pipes in there. And first of all, what we do, or what you conceptually do, is um, you figure out the um, fence nodes. The fence nodes are the boundary nodes for such a station. And in this example um, here, we have um, yeah put circles around the fence nodes. Um, so you uh, first of all you identify these nodes, um, then you remove all the elements uh, which are contained, or which yeah in this in the subgraph which is um, now um, bounded by the fence nodes. Um, what you then do is you group nodes with similar behavior and uh, call this a fence group. So here we have grouped the nodes um, which is indicated by the color, and uh, by the same behavior uh, we mean. Here you can see that uh, the pipelines coming from uh, out of the network, uh, com coming that are not contained in network station, but in the in the exterior, um, those are pipelines which have uh, which are usually have the same um, flow, the same pressure level, um, which run in parallel, and um, this is why we group them into um, the so-called fence groups. Um, in the next step, you merge these nodes into single nodes. And this looks then like this on the right hand side here, so you make a single node out of this. Um, you, now you can introduce auxiliary nodes in the middle of our simplified graph representation. Here in this example um, there are two nodes in this black box. And then finally, and what is the, probably the most important step is, you put in auxiliary links that represent the capabilities of a network station. So here on the right hand side, between the fence nodes, the merged ones, and these auxiliary nodes, you can see um, can uh, auxiliary links that are um, put in there. Um, currently, our representation or the simplified graph representation, so meaning the the definition of the boundary nodes as well as the intro, in, uh, introduction of auxiliary nodes and um, the auxiliary links, um, this is currently all done manually by hand by experts at our um, our project partner Open Grid Europe, and um, yeah, so this is how we derive these simplified graph representations. So here you can see you have uh, a, a lot smaller number, of, a much smaller number of elements, and also the number of possible operation modes um, decreases um, by doing this. All right, so this is conceptually how you simplify a network station, and now we come to the mathematical model. Um, so for each of these network stations, um, we are given flow directions. 
flow direction basically tells you where the gas is entering and where the gas is leaving and for each station there is only a limited number of possibilities from where gas may enter and um, gas may leave the station. Um, all fence nodes that are not contained in either um, the set F plus or F minus um, are in a sense neutral so there's no flow going in or out with respect to the network station. And as I said we have now a much smaller number of operation modes and the operation modes for um, the simplified network stations we call simple states. And um, for uh, each simple state we are given three sets. Um, SF um, says um, is the set of flow directions with which the simple state can work with and we are given uh, the sets SA on and SA off and these correspond to uh, auxiliary links that have to be active so that are used and um, um, uh, auxiliary links that are off so that are non there so you can think of a closed valve so no flow can be there and the pressures at the end nodes are decoupled. Here is an uh, example um, Felix already showed you our representation, so here the colors stand for pressure as well as the flow and the thicker um, an arc the bigger is the flow. And um, what you can see here uh, is the flow direction gas enters from the north and leaves to the uh, east and south as well as to the uh, uh, yeah south southeast and there is no flow um, going into the west. Yeah? And the simple state here says that uh, um, apparently on the upper left there is a, a compressing arc active, a regulating arc, so you can see here the arcs that are all, that are all black um, they are not in use, so they are off. The red ones are off and the green ones are on. Um, here is another flow direction. Um, here you can see gas is entering from the east and from the southeast and from the north and um, it now leaves to the south here and here you can see a different set of arcs being um, active so for example look at the at the at the arc on the on the uh, on the bottom um, in the example one it is closed so it's off and here it is open so it is on so here we have seen two different simple states with two different flow directions uh, and this is how you model it then. So the first constraint tells you, okay, one f in each time step one flow direction has to be active and um, the third constraint tells you that one simple state has to be active. Uh, additionally, if you have an active simple state, a flow direction that supports it, so this, which is in the set SF, has to be active. This is guaranteed by constraint number two. And um, yeah, for the auxiliary arcs that have to be on or off, we have the constraints 4 and 5 um, respectively. For arcs that are not contained in uh, one of these two sets, um, the, we can choose whether we want to use them or not, or the, the model can choose. And there are also some additional flow direction related constraints, which uh, I won't discuss here. Now we come to the different um, artificial arcs which are in there. Um, so there are basically uh, four types of arcs, uh, or artificial arcs. Um, the first one is a shortcut. Conceptually you can think of a valve that you can open or close. So if a shortcut is not active, uh, meaning that the corresponding binary vari variable is zero, um, the pressure values at the end nodes are decoupled and there is no flow. If it is active, the pressure values at the end nodes uh, have to be equal and um, you can have flow into both directions in an um, arbitrary amount. The second um, artificial arc are the regulating arcs and as the name suggests it uh, corresponds to regulators or synonymously control, uh, called control valves. Um, if it's not active again the pressure values are decoupled at the end nodes and there's no flow. Now if it is active the pressure at U cannot be smaller um, than the pressure at V and there can be an um, arbitrary amount of flow going from U to V but there, um, you have to note now here, no flow from V to U is possible and yeah, you have this additional pressure requirement. And now we come to the uh, most important and maybe also more most complex to explain um, artificial arc, which are the compressing arcs. Um, so first of all, what you have to know um, in advance is that for each network station, we're given a set of available compressor machines. 
the compressor machines are the machines that actually do the compression. And uh, if a compressing arc is active, such a machine can be assigned to it. Why is this important? Well, the compression machi machines come with three important entities uh, which are important when it comes to compression. First of all, it comes with a max flow value. So each mach machine has a maximum flow value, so a, ma a maximum amount of flow that it can compress. So second, it comes with a compression ratio. The compression ratio is a um, the max maximum compression ratio. Compression ratio is a number greater than one, which tells you, given an, an pressure that comes in, or gas which comes in with some pressure, to which factor can it be compressed to. So say you have a uh, flow coming in with 30 bar, and your ma the machine that you have assigned there has a compression ratio of two, then you have an upper bound of 60 bar that you can compress this gas to. And third, um, each machine comes with some compression power. And um, yeah, why are these uh, three entities important? Well, I will explain you now. So first of all, as I said, compressing arc, if it's not active, you cannot assign machines, the pressure values are decoupled, no flow allowed, so it basically, basically can be considered as a closed valve again. Now, if it is active, you can assign these machines. As I said, it's a compressing arc, so the pressure at V cannot be smaller than at U, so from U to V, there has to be a pressure increase. And now, first we talk about the max compression ratio. If you assign a machine, the pressure at V can be <coughs> at most R eight times greater than P U zero. So here we fix it to an, um, the initial pressure. Um, why that is, we see on the next slide. Um, the flow is limited by the sum of the max flows of the assigned machines. And uh, also we have to respect an approximated power bound equation. So Felix already showed you that uh, showed you the non the highly nonlinear equation um, called the power bound, and we uh, sample values in there and make a linear regression in order to um, yeah approximate it in linear fashion. So the corresponding constraints look like follow look as follows: For each machine I. Yeah, and each time step we have the two constraints on the top, um, which basically say that each machine can be assigned only to one arc, to one compressing arc, and it can only be assigned to this arc if uh, the com co co corresponding arc is active, which is indicated by the x variable there. Um, second, now for each compressing arc, what we have there in the first constraint, you see we sum up of the f the big F's, the big F's are the maximum flow values, so the flow pathing through this arc can be at most as high as the sum of the max flow values of the assigned machines. So for the ratios, normally what you would have liked to have is that you just multiply the compression ratios with each other, so if you have two machines having compression ratio 2, you would have like to have a max compression ratio of 4, but if you want to model this, um, you get or you derive highly nonlinear um, uh, equations and since we um, yeah since we want to avoid this in order to solve our large scale problems um, we approximated this by the linear formula you can see there which we um, yeah which we developed together with our colleagues at OGE which approximates this uh, this this um, product or this product uh, and uh, third you can see here the pi variable um, is the um, amount of power that is needed for compression and the amount of power that is needed for compression can be at most the sum of the max power values of the machines that are assigned. Um, the fourth and the fifth, we already talked about this, um, tell you that the fourth tells you, okay, the gas, the pressure has to increase. The fifth tells you uh, it can be, it can increase at most RA, which is the compression ratio that we now have, the maximum compression ratio, um, times um, here we take the pressure at time step zero, because otherwise if you take the pressure at time step t, you get another non-linearity here. And yeah, as I said, now we approximated the um, the power bound equation um, by, a lin by a linear regression, and these two constraints basically um, are the result, or result from this linear regression, and they give you the um, correspondence between the pressure coming in, the pressure going out, the flow you want to compress, and the uh, power that you need for that. And yeah, so this is the model for the compressing arc. And finally the fourth and now m most simple artificial arc to explain are the combined arcs. Um, 
for a combined arc you can choose whether it should work as a compressing arc and you can assign machines and so on or if it should work as a regulating arc and yeah if you have chosen this via the two binary variables there on top um, the modeling follows um, as for the other two entities now now we discussed how we model the transient f gas flow through the pipelines and um, I gave you an idea of how we model the um, simplified network stations and now the question is of course um, yeah, we had this conceptual uh, this this partition in mind into network stations and flow. So how are these entities then connected? Yeah, and this basically is by flow conservation. So at each node in the network, flow conservation has to hold. So at the inner nodes, the amount of ingoing flow into a node has to equal the amount of outgoing flow. And um, yeah, for entries, there is a positive value on the right hand side, and for exit or non-negative value, and for exit there is a non-positive value um, corresponding to the um, given supply or demand forecast. Um, yeah, and as I said, how is this connected? Well, basically, if you remember the boundary nodes, the merge nodes that we have, um, the flow going in there comes from pipelines and or from the network station. So these are basically the points where you can um, conceptually glue these models together. And so now we have our whole mathematical formulation, which is a mixed integer linear program. And now the question is, what is the objective? And uh, as I said, currently we want to have a stable control, meaning that we don't want to change a lot. And um, how does this work? Well, we want to minimize, first of all, the number of flow direction changes. So we introduce binary variables um, checking whether or not from one time step, from time step t to t plus one, whether or not the flow direction in st station changes. And using these binary variables, um, you, c you um, penalize that in the objective function. Uh, analogously, you do this for simple state changes and for artificial link switches, which are possible for the optional artificial links, which are not contained in S on or S off of the corresponding simple state. Um, and this is also how the weights for these variables are derived. So flow direction changes are very expensive, um, simple state changes are less expensive, and artificial link switches are somewhat cheap, although they still um, contribute some cost in the objective function. Um, what we currently discussed to penalize as well is uh, compressor and combined links being active. So currently it sometimes happens that a compressor, um, compressor arc is uh, active, but no compression is going on. So basically this used like a shortcut, which is which one wants to avoid. Um, additionally, penalizing as the assignment of machines. So you only want to use um, machines if necessary. And um, yeah, power use for compression. Um, of course, if you compress this, um, use this needs energy or power and power costs money. And so penalizing that is also an alternative. But uh, yeah, as I said, there are many different ideas what you can additionally penalize and um, also ideas of having a completely different objective function. Well, now the last thing we have to ensure is that we always get a feasible solution so that we always get um, some information that can be output to the dispatchers. Um, therefore, we introduce a three-stage approach. So first of all, we try to solve the initial MIP as I just explained to you in the first stage. If this first stage MIP is infeasible, what we next do is to add continuous slack variables on the supplies and demands. So uh, basically we can now in or decrease supplies and demands in order to get a feasible solution. Um, well, this slack is very expensive, meaning that the um, objective function coefficient for these variables is uh, very big um, in contrast or compared to the objective um, coefficients of the flow direction simple state auxiliary link changes. Well, if this second stage still does not admit a feasible solution, we furthermore add highly expensive slack on the pressure bounds um, on all nodes uh, in order to achieve a feasible solution. Well, and this last stage should always admit a feasible solution. Well, it should. We are currently uh, trying to uh, prove that yeah, the, this third stage model always um, admits a feasible solution. Um, empirically, this is true so far, um, but of course, as a mathematician, you want to have a rigorous proof of this. Well, and next, what we also have to discuss, I mean, we want to solve a problem um, 
which occurs in practice. And uh, well, you probably have learned during the last weeks how branch and bound works, and for MIP models, how um, LP based branch and bound works. Well, one problem is that uh, the solutions that are uh, that we derive from um, this um, LP based branch and bound are somewhat extreme. Um, with respect to uh, reality. So for example, consider that we have one pipe and have to deliver 10 units of flow over a time horizon of 10 time steps, where one could, what, what, what one could do is just to deliver one flow unit per time step, um, although it's also feasible um, to deliver all 10 during the first time step and then uh, don't do anything afterwards. And of course we want to have a smooth solution saying that you don't have many changes in the f um, um, in the flow and pressure values over time. So in order to achieve this, um, we introduce the following um, solution smoothening routine. Um, what we do is we take our net model MILP and we fix all binary variables to the corresponding solution value. Then we introduce variables and constraints accounting for pressure and flow differences at boundaries. So we take the boundary nodes of the network stations between um, time step t and t r minus r minus one. And um, why do we take the boundaries? Well, um, the idea is that um, in a station model we need these boundary values as a time series. And um, if it's possible, we want to have a smooth time series there, so such that the pressure and flow difference. The uh, pressure and flow values only differ by a small amount. And well, then the objective of this resulting linear program is to minimize the sum of these um, different variables. So we come, um, we can summarize. So our net model algorithm works as follows we solve the MILP. If the MILP is infeasible, we add slack on supply and demands and resolve. If this is still infeasible, we add slack on pressure bounds and resolve and as I said um, this should always give a feasible solution and finally we smooth the solution by our smoothening routine and um, thereby derive sol zero which then serves as the input to the um, station model and the station model algorithm uh, which Mark will explain in the next video. Yeah and to conclude my talk I now want to give you an outlook on what we are currently working at and our future work and the challenges challenges we are currently facing. Um, so yeah, what are we currently working on? So first of all, we are working on an automation of the process to derive the simplified graph representations. As I said, uh, currently the simplified models are done by hand by our uh, project, our colleagues of our project partner OGE. And uh, yeah, we now want to, based on the uh, operation modes and uh, the actual um, topology of these of the network station subgraphs. We want to automatize the process of deriving um, simple states, flow directions, and auxiliary links, and so on. Um, another topic we are currently um, working on, or what I already mentioned, is that we want to um, derive a solution for the nonlinear version of the momentum equations. Um, yeah, as I said, if you're interested in that topic, um, join us for the Q&A session and I will explain you how um, we are currently doing this. And um, another thing um, we are currently working on is a feedback loop from the station model to net model. So we don't want to have a two-stage approach, but a iterative process. process. So imagine the station model um, cannot find a solution for a given scenario, then the station model could um, have tell the net model here the scenario you produce here is uh, infeasible and maybe even given some more information for which time step it is infeasible or why it is infeasible so um, yeah give some more information and based on that information one could generate a no good cut um, for the net model um, telling telling it um, not to produce a solution similar to the one before uh, of course, what uh, everyone wants is more realistic element modeling. Um, some examples are that we want to um, put um, the air te temperature, um, that we want to um, include, include this into our um, compression bound. Um, Semi-fix elements are elements you can control, but not to its full extent. Um, other, so the other, another idea would be to model other single special network elements. Um, Felix already um, described some of them in his talk, but there are uh, yeah special elements. T um, t sometimes they're even unique in the network, um, which have some special rules um, on how they behave. So um, the question is, 
do you want uh, ca can you include this do you want to include this how does this impact the running time or the uh, quality of the solution um, of course one should reduce the simplification within that model um, yeah one simplification um, which is already mentioned in point two here is the that we want to have a solution for the nonlinear version of the momentum equations so of course we want to overcome this um, simplification other simplifications you've just seen is the linearization of the power bound or for the compression ratio the fixation of the initial pressure for the upper upper compression ratio bound um, another big topic is that we want to have stable solution over sequential runs as I said we want to um, produce a navigation system and the idea is to run it about every half an hour so every half an hour one want to get an updated list of recommendations and of course if I run uh, our program now and in half an hour the solutions should not differ so even though if there are multiple um, multiple feasible or optimal solutions having the same um, objective value one still w has to ensure that these solutions do not differ too much so yeah like in a car if you have a navigation system there um, you want to, you want to um, go one route and you don't and don't want the Navi to say tell you in 20 minutes ah maybe take a different route and well you don't want to replan it all the time in a sense and finally and what is one of our biggest goals currently is to increase the network size so currently we um, optimize the network which is here uh, circled in red um, um, it, this is already uh, one third of the whole network and it already includes um, two of the biggest um, network stations in the whole network it includes one of the main um, cycles and um, yeah so we want to scale up in a sense um, I mean our model of course is already applicable to um, the big network and it can, can already solve this but the runtime is still uh, an issue so we have to um, work on that yeah thanks for watching uh, I hope you enjoyed my video and could at least get us some intuition or idea of uh, what we are dealing with which is what is a really complicated and complex problem um, but it's yeah used in practice now and um, yeah, we're very proud of what we already achieved um, I already mentioned it uh, at some points of my talk if you're interested in any particular points um, or in of the problem in more general and you want to talk about this more um, please join the Q&A sessions I mean um, I'm sitting here alone unfortunately nobody is here and uh, I guess all of you know um, Mathematics and combinatorial optimization, in, in particular, is uh, the more fun, the more people join and talk about and discuss about, and um, yeah. So uh, I hope to see you later in the Q and A sessions, and um, yeah, and of course I hope to see you physically in the nearer future. Bye bye.